Well, good morning, church. It is uh, great to be here. My name is Hans Rasmussen, and uh, we're very honored to have you with us this morning. I'm excited to, uh, to start a new series. You know, I think lots of times the world says, hey, it's what's on the outside. It's what you have. It's how, what you look like. It's how much in your bank account or what degree you have. And the great thing about God is he really cares about what's on the inside. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like moms, you know, moms like have theories on some of this stuff and they, they, they want the heart to be right. But, you know, I love my mom. I hope you guys love your mom. But, you know, Parade Magazine a few years ago for Mother's Day wrote this thing and it was talking about basically lies your mom told you. OK, so I don't know about you. And, I, and I'm sure none of the mothers in here ever would have done this. But, but, you, but so this, this guy named Ken Jennings, he, he goes, he, he did this thing, whole series on unveiling the truth behind myths that parents tell us. And um, it, it's funny because there's, there's a bunch of different lies, but my mom loved this one. She was majorly into the fact that hydrogen peroxide was the cure all for like everything. Right. So she truly believed, hey, you you need to uh, you need to do this. You need to, to, uh, you know, go after the the hydrogen peroxide because it'll heal you. It'll make you all better. It'll help you so much. It's interesting because research now says that those healing bubbles are actually necrotic. It's killing the cells. So the bubbles you see are the cells dying. The stinging you feel is them dying. So it actually prolongs the healing process. It is not helpful in any way, shape, or form. Okay? So if you're the mom that said you need hydrogen peroxide on that, it, it just isn't true. I'm sorry. Um, but, you know, my mom was definitely into that and, and thought that that was, that was where everything, you know, to do it. Now, what doctors do say is that a close cousin to hydrogen peroxide is really good. It's called dihydrogen monoxide, which is water. And so that's actually better for you that, that do it. Or, or did your mom ever tell you that, hey, if you have a cut, you need to let it air out? You know, you've heard that before. Totally false. They did research that cuts that are covered healed twice as fast as cuts that are aired out. But here's the, here's the one that I want to help us with this morning. Okay? Because ultimately, I think this is the one where a lot of us have really bought into a lie that we just need to, by the glory of God, change, okay? And here's what it is. If you crack your knuckles, you're going to get arthritis. <laughs> How many of you, your parents told you that one? How many? How many? Come on. You go, but here's the deal. They have looked at the research. They've done this. There's, there's all kinds of research, which, and it's relatively amazing how much research there is on cracking knuckles. I was very surprised. My favorite uh, article was this guy out of California named Donald Unger. And he experimented for 60 years on his own hands. So twice a day for 60 years, he cracked the knuckles on the left hand and did not crack the knuckles on the right hand. After 60 years, 438,000 knuckle cracks, exactly the same. No difference. Not, none of that. So there's actual like real studies that, that say it, it has no negative effects. So what I want to do is I want to free us right now from this. On the count of three, we're going to crack some knuckles, okay? So I want you to get ready, okay? We're, we're going to do it. And there's some of you looking at me like, nah, I am not doing that. You, I don't care what you say, Hans. My mama told me and she would never lie to me. Don't buy that lie, okay? I want you to be set free. We're not about that. We're not about rules and regulations. Okay, so you ready? Here we go. One, two, three. Oh... That's a glorious sound, right? And there's some of you like, I'm still not doing it. I'm, I'm, not, I'm never coming back to church. So, so what's interesting, there is one study that said, you know what the, the most negative uh, aspect of knuckle cracking is? That it annoys your neighbor. <laughs> so, so you're welcome. Thanks for coming this morning. But ultimately, there is no difference in all of that. And, you know, there's been these studies. They've looked at all of this stuff. But, but, you know, we, we have some fun with it. But what if, what if there were things that, that we bought into? What if there's certain things that we've accepted that just aren't true? 
that we just have believed a lie or believed a myth, and we've reinforced them by what we've seen and, and, and what we've done and, and all these things. And, you know, pouring hydrogen peroxide doesn't help, and you've been at, at, abstaining from the pleasures of cracking your knuckles because of a lie. But there's serious implications in some of this, because some of the things that we've accepted as true, man, we've just believed a, a thing, and the culture around us has reinforced it. And there's dire ramifications for some of this. And, and we don't want to do that. We don't want to get stuck into that. And, and it's interesting because if you study the ministry of Jesus, which is what we're going to do right here, it was really interesting because a lot of times he spent a significant t- amount of time teaching as a rabbi. And he goes through and I want to, he goes, I want to change how you think about this. I want to change how you view God. And he debunked myths that people really believed in. And, and, and he taught so much about God and about faith and and he, a lot of times he said, you've heard it said, right? But he goes, but, but I want to teach you a new way. I want, I want to teach you some new things in this. And, and so he comes on the scene and he confronts this false belief about, about faith, about religion, about a relationship with God that many people had, had just kind of accepted, but that he knew weren't going to help them. So this morning, what I want to look at is having this inside out faith that God makes broken things whole. But we need to be broken to be made whole. But we really don't like that idea, right? We, we go, no, 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 I don't, I don't like all that. And, and, and in Jesus' time, he comes on the scene and, and he thought, Here's, here, I want to help you with what it means to follow God. And they had, at the time, religious people. Now, this is back then, not, not, not now, right? You know, and so at that time, religious people really felt you had to have your act together. You need to keep up the appearances. You need to follow all the right rules. And you need to keep the right rituals, you know, and Jesus comes along and says, look, I, I know you've been taught this, but it's on what's on the outside. But that's not what, what it's all about. It's really about what's on the inside. And, and it's what's on the inside that's supposed to come out, not the other way around. And, and so it's this inside out way of following God. And it's inside out kind of faith that Jesus truly wants us to have and that he really preached about. So we, you know, we have to do that, and I should probably shut the ringer off on my phone because somebody's calling me, and you would think they would know I'm in church. <laughs> but, um, you know, but so ultimately they had kind of learned this, this thing of, of keeping up with the appearances and make sure everybody, you know, had a smile on their face when they came to synagogue and, how you doing? Great, bro. And, you know, that outside was put together because inside wasn't as important and, and, and wanting to make sure that, that all of that was, was going and, I got booted off of the Wi-Fi, so maybe you're going to have to switch the sides for me, Dean. Um, I- interesting enough, we hit, the Wi-Fi is working great, but if, if more than 150 people log in, we get, we get booted out. Um, and, and so that's interesting. So maybe boot somebody else, Dean, and let me back in because <laughs> I, I know I'm not more important than anybody else, but it would be helpful. Um, so uh, there we go. We'll roll with the punches. It's because somebody called me. That's what messed it up. It's the cell signal from a non-iPhone product to, in too close, close proximity to my iPad, I guess. But, um, but ultimately, God goes, hey, I want to work what's, what's going on on the inside, not what's going on on the outside, and, and really help us in any way that we can. And so we're, we're going to look at what Jesus really did here and, and really figure out what God wants from us and for us in all of this. Because he looks and says, hey, it's, it's not about what's on the inside. It's, it's truly, or it is what, what it's on the inside, not on the outside. And want to help, help us with this. And so we're going to look here and, and see what Jesus did over in Luke chapter 7. You can turn over there with me if you want. And uh, we'll get a little bit of an idea here of what, what God's trying to do. And what Jesus is trying to preach. We're not going to read the whole story. I encourage you to, to read it on your own. Because it's a great one. And just for time's sake, we're not going to go through the whole thing. And... Um, and make sure that uh, we're, we're in sync here with what, what God's trying to do. And, um, man, I'm Mr. Tech is having Mr. Technical issues here um, within all of that. But Luke chapter 7. So we got a great story here of what God is trying to do with, with people and making sure that, that they're connected and, and what's going on. And um, this idea of being, being made whole. And ultimately, we need to be bro- broken to be made whole. And, and kind of the outline of this story is, is Jesus gets invited over to the guest of one of the religious leaders. Now, the religious leader that invites him over, his heart just is not in this, right? So he goes, okay, I know I'm supposed to invite over a, 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 a visiting rabbi, so I'm going to invite him over. But the normal tradition would be that if you, somebody comes into your home, what do you do when somebody comes to your house? 
you normally greet them, right? You know, so it's just like if somebody comes to, 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 to God's house here, to comes to church, we, we want to greet them and welcome them in. And, and just in the same thing, if you have somebody come to your house, if you don't greet them, they're going to be like, uh, what's the deal? Like, do you not love me? Do you not care? And that would be kind of offensive. But what this guy does is he doesn't even greet Jesus. And, you know, we shake hands. What they would have done at the back in the day was give a kiss, which I'm kind of grateful we don't do anymore. Um, and that would be a little bit awkward and, uh, you know, in all of that. And, and so I think in this is he doesn't greet him. Another thing would have been to say, hey, look, you can wash your feet. And normally they have a servant do it. If the, and at the very least, they just offer him water to do that. And if somebody's a really honored guest, they'd pour oil on their head and say, here's some olive oil. I'm going to spend some money on you that I just want you to be look all great and, and feel very encouraged by, by being here with us today. And so all of that happening, and it just didn't happen with them. It didn't, it didn't go through, and, and, and he didn't didn't do it. So if you can give me the, the next slide there with that scripture. I think it's about three slides in. But, um, you know, as he goes through there, he, he's trying to help them see that this is here. And, and in, um, oh, yeah, I forgot I had that in there. So uh, in, the, in his book here, The Lord Break Me, is a great one. It, he, he, he has this quote. It says, usually when someone's broken, when something is broken, its value declines. It disappears altogether. So broken dishes and broken bottles and broken mirrors are generally scrapped. They're thrown out. Even a cracker in furniture, a tear in the cloth, greatly reduces its resale value. So, so what's he saying there? He says, basically, hey, here's the deal. If something's broken, we live in a culture today that's a throwaway society. right? We have more disposable stuff than any other people in all of history. You know, If you have something and it gets a tear in it, do you think, oh, where's the sewing kit? Let me fix it. Most of us go, oop, I have to throw that away. I'm done with that. Or this thing, you know, it makes some noise. And so that just won't work. And, and so we throw it out and we don't live anymore the way that the, to, uh, to recycle and reuse. We throw things out because it, it has no, no value in our mind. And we just ultimately get rid of it. And God goes, no, 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 that, that's totally different than how I think. That's totally different in how is it, you know, but broken mirrors and whatnot, we throw them away. We just get rid of it. Next slide. But he goes on to say this, he says, but, but this isn't the way things work in the spiritual realm. In the world, we know if something breaks, the value goes down, but God puts a premium on broken things, especially broken people. You know, when God sees broken, he sees beautiful. We see broken, we think, throw it away. And we wonder why we feel like sometimes when we look and say, hey, there's this part of me that's broken, well, we feel worthless. But God goes, no, 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 I don't look at that like the world does. I look at this like it's a great thing. And in Luke chapter 7, he kind of gives us this example of, of what he's doing here. And uh, down in verse 50, we're going to pick up there in a, in a minute. But uh, as, this, as they're reclining at the table, they didn't really greet him. This, it says a sinner comes in in verse 37. And this sinner comes in, it was a nice word for prostitute. She was well known in the whole community that, that she was a prostitute. And, and all of the people there looking at her and goes, ooh, What's Jesus doing? He's talking to a bad person. He's talking to a sinner. He's talking to a prostitute. And they knew who she was, interestingly enough. But, but then it starts to get super uncomfortable. Right? Because this prostitute comes in and she must have heard something about Jesus. She must have been there when he taught. And maybe she was there the day before, the day or prior. And we don't really know what was going on. But, but she must have heard something at some point from Jesus that said, I'm broken. And I think Jesus might be able to make me whole. Somehow she thought that God could do something beautiful with this. And so she, in her brokenness, shows up to this dinner party. Says, I'm crashing the party. Now get this, she never would have been invited to this party in a million years. Right? Like, she would not have been on the guest list. This was not a safe place for her. She would have been avoided like this, you know, this place at all costs. Because people like this judged her and, and, and believed bad things about her. And thought, oh, you know what, we don't want anything to do with her. And, and, and somehow she knew... That, that Jesus could fix this, over, even though she felt like she was broken beyond repair. And a Pharisee would have looked at somebody like this as a throwaway. But she knows that that's not how Jesus sees her. So she's going to do something that I think many of us would say, hey, that's totally impulsive. What are you doing? And you didn't plan for that. Was that in your budget? And it, it's embarrassing. It's inappropriate. It's almost unacceptable. So Jesus is reclining at this table, and this woman approaches, and she stands at the filthy feet of Jesus. And everybody's quiet because they're thinking, oh, she's a prostitute. and What is she doing here? And surely this rabbi is going to you know, rebuke her and tell her to get out. And I'm sure she feels the stares of condemnation. 
other people have, have their eyes down and going, oh my gosh, we're embarrassed by this, and she's just here, and I shouldn't look, and not Jesus. And she looks at Jesus, and in some way, shape, or form, he must know what's going on in her heart, and lets her know in some way, hey, you're welcome here, even in your brokenness. And maybe it's a warm smile or whatnot, but, but he welcomes her in. And, but then this woman you know, looks and, and goes, oh my gosh, and, and she just is so motivated in all of this. And as, as she's welcomed in, I think she's just undone. She has it together, and she's, I don't know what, she, what her plan was. But as Jesus looks and accepts her, she just starts to weep. And I'm sure as she's weeping, her tears are starting to fall and they hit the dirty feet of Jesus. And she starts to notice that, oh my gosh, his feet weren't cleaned. And so she, 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 as, she, as her tears are flowing, as they're going down, she starts to, to wash his feet with her, with her tears. And then he, she undoes her hair, which in this culture, that was only to be done in the bedroom with your husband. He was the only person to ever see your hair down. That was for, your, for his glory kind of thing in their marriage. And so at this point, the religious people have got to be about crawling out of their skin. This is not how we do this. This is not what we're, we're about. You shouldn't do that. This isn't how we worship God. This isn't what we're supposed to do. You're doing something, oh, I feel really uncomfortable about. They, I'm sure, were just, you, ah. And she doesn't seem to care. So she doesn't have a towel, so she washes his hair there. And then she, she, she looks down and she's washing his feet and she has this bottle of perfume around her neck. And it was probably for, as part of her job. And normally it would be used one drop at a time. And she goes, uh-uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pouring the whole thing out. And, and she pours this out. She pours her whole life and she just empty, empties it out because she's so broken and she doesn't know what she wants to do here. But her whole life is, is poured out and it was inappropriate. It was reckless. It was impulsive. And Jesus looks at it and he goes, this is beautiful. This is beautiful. See, he sees the broken as beautiful. And so in this story, what Jesus does is he turns everything upside down, inside out. He condemns then or rebukes Simon the Pharisee. Opposite of what this guy thought was going to happen, right? I hope she gets hers. You know, Jesus is going to get after her. And he looks at her as beautiful, him as broken. And you've got this religious leader who has all his act together. He follows all the rules. He does everything he's supposed to. And Jesus rebukes him. And he turns around and he commands this prostitute who's this broken mess, just turns it upside down. And it's kind of amazing. He ends his story... Dean, slide 19 for me, please. He ends this story by just giving this lady incredible value and purpose. And he says in verse 48, he says, your sins are forgiven. And in verse 50, he says, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. She's made whole. You know, as you look at this story today, I've got a trick question for you. Okay? And it's a trick question. I'm telling you up front. I'm not trying to trick you, but it's a trick question. Who would you rather be in this story? Now, 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 I'm not asking you who you're most like. I'm asking you, who would you rather be? There's a big difference. But see, what we want is we want to be both. We want to be the religious guy who has it all perfectly together. I follow all the rules. I look just right, and everybody thinks I'm awesome. But we want to be accepted like the, the prostitute who's totally broken without having to be broken. And that's where the trick comes in, right? We want both. And it doesn't exactly work that way. See, most of us who've been in church for a while, we, we know we want to be well-respected and have it all together for people to think a certain way about us, whether it's true or not, to be honest. We keep our problems behind closed doors. And when we're in public, we put on a smile on our face and everything's great and there's no issues. And we want to be that person. We want to experience the love and grace of Jesus. Can I have it all together? And and it doesn't exactly work that way. See, there's no way to wholeness except through the door marked broken. And if you want to know the love and grace of Jesus deeply, if you want to have that kind of value, if you want to have that kind of purpose for your life, I'm telling you, there's only one way to do it, and it's through the door called broken. But here's the good news. 
And maybe you already know this, but in case you don't, I thought it'd be important to, to be, be super clear, okay? It's a secret, but we're all broken. <laughs> right? Everybody's normal till you get to know them. <laughs> and all of us are broken. And here's the kicker. If you're the one who thinks, you know what, I, I might be like very minorly, slightly broken. You're probably the most broken out of the whole bunch. <laughs> you know how I know that? Guilty. I, I know that because I go, oh, I got it all together. And God goes, oh, my gosh, you are such a mess. You're so broken. And that's what we see in this story, right? That because the Pharisee, he's sitting, sitting there thinking, he goes, she's the one that should be embarrassed can't believe she showed up here. No, he's the one that should be embarrassed. He's the one who gets, gets rebuked for, for his brokenness. Or, and it's Simon. It's Simon who is broke. He's not broken. He's broke, but he's not broken. And he doesn't acknowledge that he's broke, but that she is. And here's how broke this guy is. He spent his whole life studying the scriptures. By the time he was 12, he knew the first five books of the Bible. There's 300 plus prophecies about the Messiah, about Jesus in the Old Testament. He knew them by heart. And Jesus, the Messiah, is sitting at his table. He studied this his whole life. He's, he's there with them. He didn't kiss him on the cheek. He didn't wash his feet. He didn't anoint his head. That's how broke he is. He's studying to see when the Messiah comes. He's got the Messiah in front of him, and he missed it completely. Wow. So he's broke, but he doesn't even know he's broke. And that's the thing about brokenness. The less you see it in yourself, the more you need it. And so the point of the sermon really isn't to be broke. We're already broke. I think the point is for, for me to understand that I need to be broken. I need to have brokenness. The point of this is for you to understand there needs to be brokenness. Where we stop trying to hide. We stop trying to pretend like all the pieces fit together. Instead we say, God, this is it. These are all the broken pieces. This is who I am, and, and I'm really broken. You know, there's a TED Talk by this lady named Brenna Brown. And uh, she's a sociologist, and she has this TED Talk. It's got like 15 million hits. And it's called The Power of Vulnerability. And she talks about how, as long, uh, how we all long, we all need to be at this place with people with whom we can be vulnerable. But most of us don't have that, Right? We don't, know the, we don't know those kind of relationships. We long, it, she talks about it, in other words, to, to admit that we're broken. Deep down, we know we want to do it. We know we're all broke, but, but we don't have this sense that I can, be, I can share that really with somebody, and they'll accept me. We want vulnerability, authenticity, but we just don't feel safe. And here's what she says in her talk. Slide 21, Dean. It says, we are those people. We are those people. That's the truth. Most of us are one paycheck, one divorce, one drug addict kid. Next. One mental health diagnosis, one serious illness, one sexual assault, one drinking binge, one night of unprotected sex, one affair from being those people. Next slide. The ones we don't trust, the ones that we pity, the ones we don't let our children play with, the ones that bad things happen to, the ones we don't want living next door. But we are... Those people. You are them. I am them. We're broken. Everyone in here is broken. There's not one person in this room who's totally put together. Right? Because you go, okay, if you knew the real me, you, you would believe in the power of God. Right? <laughs> if you knew the real me, you wouldn't sit next to me. If you knew the real me, you'd never hug me. If you knew the real me, you'd know how broken I am and how unworthy and untouchable and unclean and unholy and un, un, un. And God goes, no, no, no. If you just come to me broken, man, I'll help make you whole. And I don't know how impressive you look on the outside, but I'm telling you, we are all broken. You know, we're the people who ignore the hurts of others as long as our needs are being taken care of. We're the people who yell at each other in the car on the way to church, and then we get outside and pretend like everything is okay. Hey, smile, kids. We're those people. I watch the parking lot sometimes. Or I'm just in my car on the way to church. 
We're the people who think that God is somehow more impressed because we've come up with this whole list of rules that, that we follow that aren't even mentioned in the Bible. And we follow those and we hold people accountable, accountable to those. We're those people. We're the people who go into debt to keep up with appearances. We're the people who look down on others because they're different from us in some kind of way. We're the people who work 50 plus hours a week trying to prove our worth. We're the people who take the easy way out and log on to a porn site. We're the people who have holes punched in our closet doors because we don't have to deal with our anger. That's us. Broken. We're the, we're the people who spend hours on social media trying to convince people that we're awesome and our, our lives are somehow better than they really are. We're all broken. You know, we all, we all, we all think of things and you go, man, we're, we're also, you know, we're the church that we go, hey, we need people to help in children's ministry. Hey, we need people to help in children's ministry. Hey, we need somebody to help with coffee. Hey, we need, you know, hey, can you volunteer to mentor? Wow, that's, yeah, we should have somebody do that. Hey, what time's the game on at home? And we ignore some of those needs. That's how broken we are. We see the needs and sometimes we just totally ignore it. But some of those are hypothetical. The children's ministry is really not. Start a new rotation here in a couple of weeks and we do need some more people. But yet we go, yeah, somebody should do that. And we just think, you know what? We know it's in our heart, right? And I go, there's, there's all kinds of things that we're broken. There's not one of us in here more deserving or worthy of God's love than anybody else. Why? Because we're all broken. So what do we do with it? We go, okay, okay, we're all broken. Here's what we do. We hide it. <laughs> That's the solution. Is that what you're telling me, Hans? No, I don't need to tell you that. Society tells you that. The devil tells you that. Your past tells you that. You know, as a kid, when you break something, what do you do? You hide it. it you know, I remember vividly as a kid breaking this vase thing and I knew if I left it there, I was going to get caught. If it disappeared, I had a good chance of her never noticing. Right? So I hid it. We moved. She found it. So, but what do we do personally? What do we do in our heart? Go, I'm broken. Yep, I get it. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to hide it. I just need a beer. I'm going to hide it. I'm just going to smoke one joint. It's legal now, right? It's, you know, it's marijuana. It's fine. And God made it, so it must be good. I'll, I'll just do that. That's okay. I can hide it that way. Upcoming four weeks from now, I'm going to do a whole lesson on weed word and the uh, weed word and the worship and worshiping God. And we're going to talk about it. What does the Bible say about it? We'll look at every scripture that talks about weed and how we're supposed to do it that. But we try to hide it that way. We medicate or we get into debt. We're, we're the most in debt people in human history. And 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 that's what happens when we try to hide our brokenness. It just doesn't work. And so we're all broken and. What we really need is brokenness, where we recognize the reality of our broken condition and understand that there's no wholeness except through that door marked brokenness. And that's the bad news. But here's the good news. God makes the broken whole through Jesus Christ. And it's only after being made broken that we're ready to fulfill our purpose to be used by God. You know, an example of this is in Isaiah chapter 53, if you want to turn over there with me. It's the kind of help that, it, 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 it kind of helps us see how God makes us whole. In Isaiah 53, in, in verse 5, it says this. It's this example or this picture of how it looks. It, it, says, it, <clears throat> it says, but he, Jesus, was ruin, wounded for the wrong we did. He was crushed for the evil we did. The punishment which made us well was given to him, and we are healed because of his wounds. But he was wounded for the wrong we did. He was crushed for the evil we did. In all of this, we are healed because of it. You know, there's a couple words here that I, that I want you to pay attention to. First one is wounds, wounded or wounds. And um, in Hebrew, it's halal. It means to break, to pierce, to defile, to wound. But the next word is healed. And that's rafa. To make whole, to heal, to cure, to repair, to make healthy. 
God goes, okay, you're, you're, you're broken, you're pierced, you're defiled. But Jesus can heal you, cure you, repair you, make you healthy, make you whole. So what's that scripture saying? Next slide, it says this. It says, we're made whole because he was broken. If you go, I want to be whole, it's only through Jesus that we can do that. It's only after being broken that we really are ready to fulfill the purpose that God gave us and what God wants from us and for us. Over in Jeremiah 18, I'd like you to turn over there. You can look up online because I, I did it out of the Holmes Christian Standard Bible because uh, I liked how it said it. And what he's talking about here is a great picture of this idea. It says, this is the word that came down to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down at once to the potter's house. There I will reveal my words to you. So I went down to the potter's house and, and he was there working away at the wheel. But the jar that he was making from the clay became flawed in the potter's hand. So he made it into another jar, as seemed right for him to do. The word of the Lord came to me. House of Israel, can I, treat, can I not treat you as the potter treats his clay? This is the Lord's declaration. Just like clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, house of Israel. House of Israel, can I not treat you as the potter treats his clay? So ultimately what he's saying here is he goes, he goes, I know your jar has not turned out how you wanted it to turn out. Do you feel like that sometimes? You go, uh-uh. I wanted a jar and I'm a plate. Or I'm a dog dish, it feels like. And you go, I thought it was going to be different. I know that you had in mind that your jar would look like and what your life would look like. And it hasn't happened. And at some point along the way, it's gotten broken. So you hide the pieces you keep on pretending like everything is okay. Or you can say to the potter, God, will you make me into another jar? One that seems right to you. And God says, hey, that's what I want for my people. I know the jar is broken. I know it hasn't turned out how you wanted. Let me see what I can do with this. And here's a really cool thing. Next slide. Just the first, there's, there's three builds on this one. So there's a broken teapot. And uh, there's a really cool thing in Japan called kintsugi. And I'll have to, I should have asked uh, Sanai how to pronounce that correctly, but it's close enough, okay? So what do they do? They, they take these broken pots, and normally what, what do you do with something like that? You throw it away. But not so with God. Next slide. So what they do is they take these broken pots, and they, rather than trying to hide the cracks, they fill it with gold and they accentuate it. They say, okay, here's how it was broken. Next slide. But I'm going to take that and I'm going to fill it in and I'm going to make this thing that was broken beautiful. It originated in the 1500s in Japan. And so the, highlight, the, the cracks are highlighted and it makes it look really cool. Next slide. Here's a big old vase that they did with this. And, and so you have this valuable piece of ceramic and, and maybe it falls and maybe it gets broken or maybe you have a kid like me. And uh, they break it. And you take the, the pieces and a goldsmith goes through it and, and accentuates those. You know what's really cool? Is these are worth way more than that broken before it was broken. And so even collectors have been accused of taking old pots and old dishes and breaking them and then doing this and saying, oh, look, that's what I got. <laughs> and doing that. And, and it's so cool because you're looking at this and this is what God does for us. We're all broken. We all have cracks and we try to hide them. That's our instinct. It's what we've been taught. But God says, you know what? Those very things that you're most overwhelmed by, the thing you're most afraid of, the very things you want to keep secret the most, the very things you most want to be done away with, the, the very thing that you wish was not true about you, if you let me, if you give me the opportunity, God says, I'll turn it into something more beautiful and much more valuable than before. See, God uses broken things. It takes broken soil to produce a crop, broken clouds to give rain, broken grain to give us bread. And ultimately, that's what God wants. You know what else you need to have to be broken to work? A light stick. I started to think, you know, what, what, what would be that? I go, if you want your light to shine, if you want it to work, you can't keep it whole. You have to break it. 
remember at preteen camp, one of the kids goes, but mine isn't working. I go, you ought to break it. And he's like, oh, I can't break it. I'll get in trouble. I go, no, no, crack it. Just like your knuckles. Go for it. <laughs> and see, God says, hey, I want your light to shine. But it's only by being broken that your light can shine. If we stay whole, we can never complete what God created us to do. He says that we're a light. We're to be a, this light on a, on a hill. We're, we're to be the light of the, uh, of the, to the world. We're supposed to show Jesus. We're supposed to be those people. But we want to be whole like Simon. We don't want to be broken like a prostitute. But yet that's what God wants for us. We're going to take communion right now. We're going to play a song called Sweetly Broken. You know, as, we, as, as you listen to that song, as you meditate about taking communion, here's what I'd like you to do. Is not figure out how you can be more put together. Not figure out how you can hide it more. But figure out how you can embrace the brokenness that you have. Because we're all broke. But it's only until we, we really get broke in that we can shine the light the way that God really wants us to. See, Jesus came that we could have life and life to the full. He says, give me your broken pieces and I'll put it back together. I'll make it into something beautiful. And that's the only, only way that we really do, do have true worth is through Jesus Christ. You know, as we're, as we're taking this, let, let's meditate on who Jesus was and you know, if you want to talk to somebody about your relationship with God or, man, I want to, I want to become a member of this broken church because that's who we are up front. We don't have it all together. Spend about two minutes with me and you'll figure it out. But that's who we are. We're a bunch of broken people who are made beautiful by Jesus. And we'd love to have you be part of the family. Or if you've never studied the Bible, if you've never done that, I'm going to be standing in the back after service and I'd love to talk and have, you know, if you want to pray or whatever you need. Let's do that together. But let's pray for communion right now. Heavenly Father, God, you are amazing. God, I love that you don't want us to have it all together. And I love, Father, that you know that we don't. God, I'm so grateful that you took a broken man like me and saved me. It wasn't because of the good things I'd done and it was the exact opposite. It was when I was still a sinner that you died for me and, and saved me from myself. And God, I'm grateful that you've done that for so many in here. And Father, I pray that you'd help us to be a church of broken people. We're already broke. Let's be real. Let's be honest. I'm so grateful that, that you give us the ability to do that. Help us to, to be a safe place for sinners to come in to be loved up on. God, I don't know what Jesus did to welcome that prostitute in, but help us to have that same look on our face, to have that same love in our heart, that no matter who walks through the doors of this church or the doors of our life or the doors of our house, that they feel welcomed and loved and valued. We're so grateful for Jesus who paid the ultimate price so that we could be forgiven. And that we could know you. And that we could be made whole. Lord, we love you. Pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.